Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. So yeah, this this obscure even-toed ungulate, which they call the ships of the desert. What can they teach us? Few animals can survive the drastic temperature changes or 50 mile an hour winds and snow from Siberia in the winter time to the heat in the summertime. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Hey, right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Angie, you picked this one today. I know. I've been waiting anxiously. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. yeah it's a good one. Oh, it's been so much fun. A trip down memory lane. Today, we're going to talk about a species that's uh, very close to my heart that I worked with for a long time at the zoo. The Bactrian camel. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you, you know, we were texting back and forth. And it was like, when you first said that, I, for some reason, thought of the dromedary camel. I just, I don't know why, you know, whenever you think of camel. Oh, don't worry. If you stay hop, tuned today, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll clear up the difference for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the two, the two camel species, but this is the one with the, the two humps, right? So, correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The Bactrian camel. I always think that the Bactrian letter starts with the letter B and mm-hmm. if, if you turn that letter over, it looks like the two humps of the camel. Right. Where dromedary right. starts with a D, and mm-hmm. if you turn that over on its side, that's like the one hump of the dromedary camel. Right. And so, I actually have a funny story about the dromedaries, so I'll, <laughs> I'll save that for in a little bit. But yeah, I, I think what's really something that I was very aware of, but I'm not sure if, if you were, but the wild Bactrian camels are one of the rarest mammals on the planet. I know. I did not know that. So I was like... So excited doing my research this week when you brought these up. And I was like, wow, I did not know that. I really didn't. I believe they're the eighth most endangered large mammal. Yeah, they're in big, they're in big trouble. They're in big trouble. But, you know, there are some, some organizations out there that we'll cover yeah. later. And then, that are doing I, and a good job. yeah, just because I got to work with them, it'll probably, I probably, I don't even know if I have any facts. I'm just going to tell stories about Mira and India. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, real quick, some reminders, you know, uh, please go to iTunes if you haven't and provide a rating and review. We're just trying to get more traffic, more listeners. Uh, thank you to the the uh, one of our our favorite friends there in Gainesville, Dr. Cottrell. She uh, she's been really great. Yes, yeah, uh, so if you haven't checked does... out that interview about yeah. busting bat myths, she's a yeah. bat expertise, and it's a real fun interview. I mean, she's a conservation hero. Like oh, she's absolutely. a huge hero of mine. Yeah, she does amazing work with wildlife there in Florida. And then I just want to say thank you to Jessica from Austin, who sent a really awesome message to Angie and I, and it made our week. I just got goosebumps, so, which are called, it's called yeah. frisson when you get goosebumps for like <laughs> yeah. the make, because you're happy or because of music yeah. or artwork. So yeah. yeah. Thinking about the, uh, the message that she put on Facebook that basically was very, very flattering and telling us that she enjoys our podcast. It, yeah, yeah, it just gave me goosebumps, even though I, yeah, I, I, know. I know about it. I think about it every day. So thank you, Jessica. Yeah, and she's a wildlife biologist, you know, so she's... Yeah, she's the real her, deal. Her, her, we'll have, to, yeah, interview, we'll have so, to interview her sometime. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. I'm sure she... Yeah, I, I will. I'll send her a message and see if she wants to. And then Alicia from our special zoo this week, which we'll talk about later, but Brookfield Zoo there in Chicago. Oh, yes. So, Gotta love yeah. uh, my hometown, or, well, my adopted hometown, Chicago, and all yeah. the wonderful animal keepers uh, at Brookfield and Lincoln Park Zoo. So thank you, Alicia. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have a, a, a rumble in Chicago between the Brookfield <laughs> Zoo keepers and the uh, Lincoln Park, right? Ah, uh, we all love each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So, yeah, this, this obscure, even-toed ungulate, which they call the ships of the desert. Yes. So just crazy. It's good. Their physiology is great. It's just such a fun, exciting animal we're talking about today. I know. It's super exciting. And I, I'm actually, obviously, you're my dear friend. And I'm happy to share all this cool camel stuff with you because, because for the most part, I'm not a know-it-all. But this was a very easy <laughs> uh, podcast for me to put together because I, I knew or was reminded of a right. lot of these adaptations and behaviors and their nutrition uh, from working with them for so long. But I did... This is why I love doing this job yeah. or volunteer. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Make any money. <laughs> it's yeah. not a real job. Uh, but is I learned a few things 
myself. Mm-hmm. So stick with us, and then I will definitely chime you in on what stumped the chump, what uh, what I okay. what I learned today about the camels. And obviously, you learned a ton of stuff. But and one of the cool things that I learned today was actually about camel vocalizations. So when I worked with them in the barn, I and or out in their yard, mm-hmm. I always thought that the camel, some of their vocalizations, they have many different ones, mm-hmm. but it reminded me of Chewbacca from mm-hmm. Star Wars. Which is actually, yeah. I don't think I need to tell people that's from Star Wars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I know. It, well, I know my husband. I, I'm yeah. not as huge into it as John is. John is like, yeah. you know, I think when Disney opens their Star Wars like hotel thing, Park, we're gonna have to yeah, like go yeah. stay there, and it's gonna be not very fun uh, for me. I'm but so I'll, jealous. I'm so I'll, jealous. I'll suck it up because he does a lot of nice <laughs> things for me. But even with me not being a super crazy fan uh, like him, I just always thought that it sounded like Chewbacca. So for today's mm-hmm. research. I have two clips, and this will be a fun thing okay. for the listeners and for you, Chris. A little game. I'm going to play the first clip, and we'll call that clip one, vocalization. Okay. And then I'll play the second clip for clip two, vocalization. And at the end, you can guess which one is a Bactrian camel okay. and which one is Chewbacca. All right. All right. So let's play them real quick, and then we'll see. Okay. And then okay. people can think about it over the next uh, 45 minutes or hour. Oh, my talking. gosh. This is so much fun. Okay. Uh, right, uh, <laughs> this is such a jerk. Uh, <laughs> stand by. Let me get the clip. And now this is clip two. <laughs> Okay, Angie, these, you know, let's let's start talking more about these obscured, even-toed ungulates, your favorites. Yeah, the single toes are your favorites, too. I mean, those are your babies, the horses, the rhinos. Zebras. You know, the, the mm-hmm. taper, right? Yeah, zebras, even though the tapers have three toes. But they call these the ships of the desert. Either I both know. species. They're yeah. incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. Crazy adaptations. Their, their physiology, I, I'll never forget sitting in a class for undergrad, and it was an animal mm-hmm. physiology class. And it was kind of like the first true class in my major uh, that mm-hmm. was not, you know, math or something, eh, or chemistry mm-hmm. or organic chemistry. Yeah. Really. All the fun Physics, stuff. Yeah. Really. But, anyways, yeah. <laughs> and I, it was the camel. And the giraffe, which we'll do the vet giraffe mm. soon. Don't, yeah, you know, soon. Stay tuned. Yes, very soon. Uh, but the giraffe, the giraffe and the camel. Some of the physiology going over is when I I realize now, twenty years later or so, uh, that that's <laughs> that's like when I became a physiologist. Was yeah. learning yeah, about these really cool facts that we're going to share with you today because they're so bizarre and they're so incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just crazy how they've looked, how they have adapted to survive in some of the harshest environments on Earth. Oh, they're incredible. And yeah, and they have had a huge impact on our own development and evolution as a species, much like the horse. I mean, just camels in, in many parts of the world have impacted, you know, human development, you know, our ability to travel farther, faster. Again, spreading our genetics, trade goods, things like that. And then the Silk Road about how the Bactrian camels have had such a huge impact on connecting, you know, China and Asia to Europe and, you know, Western Asia. So so these these animals have been with us, you know, for thousands of years every step of the way. Oh, yeah. Now, really cool. Yeah. The, the Bactrian camel is from Central Asia. The dromedaries are the single hump from Africa and the Middle East. Now, so... Let's talk about the differences in the Bac- Bactrian camels. What there's a wild species and a domestic, right? Sure. Yeah. So I think that this is where people get a little confused at first. Is that you're they're like, what do you mean the two hump the Bactrian camel is right. critically endangered? Uh, the, mm-hmm. I, yeah, we see them all over, um, and that's because there's a big difference between domestic camels, which is the do- dromedary and the Bactrian. Bo- both mm-hmm. of those species have been domesticated. But there is a species of Bactrian camel that's known as the wild Bactrian camel. And so the wild Bactrian camel is actually a separate species known as Camelus ferris, so ferris for wild, whereas the domesticated 
Bactrian camel. That's what I worked with at the zoo. That's going to be Camelus bactrianus. Mm-hmm. And as recent studies have shown that skin taken from the, the remains of dead wild Bactrian camels over in Mongolia and China were taken in for DNA testing. And the, re- the results are just remarkable. It basically showed that there's two mm-hmm. or three distinct genetic differences between the domestic Bactrian camel and the wild Bactrian mm-hmm. camel. And they have a 3% base difference. So the base, the base right. pairs, A, T's, C's, and G's, and, yeah, the, and DNA. the DNA. Yeah. And 3%. So that's, yeah. that's big. That's definitely a different species. Yeah. And because some, yeah. some had tossed in the idea that maybe, oh, the wild is a sub, or the domestic is a subspecies of the wild or vice versa. But mm-hmm. no, no, this new genetic testing show they're definitely distinct. Um, and they're able to stay a distinct wild population because they're so isolated where they live in these right. harsh climates of Mongolia and the Gobi Desert um, and, and parts mm-hmm. of China. So any there's just not domestic camels hanging out there. Well, and then just a little bit differences in their physiology. You know, this is the largest living camel. Yes, uh, this, the Bactrians are. Yeah. This one for anybody who's been around a typical camel, it's probably a dromedary, a one hump one, um, and they're mm-hmm. impressive. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll have Chris put some pictures in the show notes of me working with one of the back, one of the Bactrian camels, and they are crazy big, crazy big, bigger, yeah. yeah. And so they're they're just very impressive. Yeah, the size is very impressive, and so these ones again, they have two very large humps, mm-hmm. and then what I just you know thinking about these these animals. That U-shaped neck is just bizarre. Like, that's just what's bizarre about camels. You know, they just have that, like, sagging neck. Well, yeah, it's just, like, just... from the withers or from, like, the point in between yeah. the shoulders, it dips down and then comes back up, basically. Comes mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's, just, it's just crazy. So, these ones can be almost seven and a half feet at the shoulder or the top of the mm-hmm. hump. So, pretty, pretty big, like Angie just said, or 230 centimeters Body can be as long as eleven and a half feet or three hundred and fifty oh, yeah. centimeters. That was that was huge. Right. right? Well, yeah, and the way and they then, reach their head up too, yeah. they can definitely reach their head. I mean, more than eight feet. Pretty oh, tall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then they weigh up to a ton or a thousand kilograms. So oh, you know. And then they're oh yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was I was I was yeah. doing pounds over here. Mm-hmm. And then their coats are. What did you say? Their their coats. How would you describe? Oh, their, their coats. coats are, oh, they're beautiful. They almost remind me of when we described their orangutan. But they have this brown, orangish, mm. uh, dark, dark caramel. Yeah, yeah. caramel colored uh, long hair. So in the winter time, uh, their hair can grow up to uh, two hundred fifty five millimeters long. So what was right. that like? Really long. Two point five centimeter or twenty five point five centimeters. Yeah, it's like it was almost like a twelve inches. Yeah, is what I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was and we'll, yeah, we yeah, yeah. up some. Uh, their necks get like really shaggy, and especially the males mm. are just very <laughs> impressive. And this coat's it's thicker on the heads, the neck, the humps, the forelegs, and the mm-hmm. tail regions. And it is seasonal. Uh, of course, they're going to have the hair in the winter time, and then they'll shed most most of the the fur, the hair off to have more of a sleeker coat in the summertime due to seasonal changes. Right, and it, when I get to their evolution a little bit, there's there's some reasons why they they developed that way to survive the the cold. Some recent discoveries. So, like Angie said, these are from China and Mongolia, and still very isolated, small pockets of the Gobi Desert. But this was really cool. So I, I started looking a little bit, you know, not just the wild, but the domestic, and they're all over the world. The domestic or feral. Okay, so just to remind the listeners, a feral animal. So, like, we have wild horses in the United States. Those aren't true wild, quote, unquote, horses, meaning they're like the Przewalski horse, that they've never been manipulated by man. A feral animal, feral pigs, feral dogs, feral cats, feral horses, feral camels, come from the domestic stock. So there are feral or domestic Bactrian camels all over the world, and really a cool place near me that has a bunch of them is Australia. Nice. I was yeah. going to say, like, that's where I want to live. Um, yeah. Forget about feral cats and pigs yeah. that we have here in Florida. Yeah. Oh, man, camels. I bet they – are they a nuisance, though? Or, or yeah, they- they've, been, they've been dealing with them, eradicating them a little bit or controlling the population. There is around 300,000 camels in Australia. They're okay. main, mainly the dromedaries, but there are some Bactrians in there. Okay. So they, they're surviving fine in the wilds of oh, Australia. Oh, yeah, they're tough as 
nails. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be yeah. just fine uh, yeah. as long as as long as people don't mess with them. Right. That's that's the thing. Right. Yeah. 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 So I thought that was cool. And even in the United States, there were some wild camels in the desert, but uh, really? in the 20th century, they yeah, yeah, they brought them. They brought camels over thinking they would be great for the cavalry in the 1800s, uh-huh. and so they 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 did great, but they just kind of got rid of them. And then I think at the early 20th century, they they were finally all brought into captivity. But oh, okay, the, interesting. Yeah, but there's almost a, a million worldwide of domestic Bactrians you know, mm-hmm. throughout, yes. throughout the world. Yes. And right. I think that's why it's so shocking that the wild Bactrian camel mm. is so critically endangered. Right. Right. So, I mean, with so many camels, this, this is a good segue. Why care about the wilds when there's so many domestics? Well, you're asking the wrong lady because I worked with yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's, I'm like a bleeding heart, Chris. So when I recently for other projects I'm working on, I've been digging through old photos and videos of me working with the camels at the zoo, Endy and Mira. Uh, mm-hmm. and I just, they're just amazing. They're amazing, amazing creatures. They're really intelligent. They're trackable, trainable. They have huge personalities <laughs> like that. Mm-hmm, it's an understatement. Mm-hmm. If you, I mean, I think my horses have personalities, but right. these camels, oh my goodness. So, and then in preparation for this podcast, I of course uh, was looking and put a, put a picture of Mira and Andy on the very first slide of my show notes mm-hmm. to just be inspired and kind of, and their adaptations, which we're going to get into today. We're going to talk about some mm-hmm. really, really cool things to be, to survive in these harsh deserts to it mm-hmm. get from minus 40 degrees Celsius to yeah, I know, I know. That's what New Zealand Celsius, felt like this week. <laughs> that swing. <laughs> you know? Oh, oh my goodness. No way. It, it's zero. It's zero you Celsius, are, but it feels like minus 40. You are silly. Oh, you're, oh, more <laughs> boy. Your, your skin is thin from Florida. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. I mean, uh, the Bactrian camels and I lived in Chicago where it was like minus <laughs> 15, 16, 20 wind chill Fahrenheit. That is Fahrenheit, though. So I would not, die. I not would as close, not as cold as the Gobi Desert can get. But yeah, yeah, so just some of their adaptations are incredible, and mm-hmm. I just you know I'd hate to I hate to lose any any type any species of camel uh, at any mm-hmm. point in time, especially their wild counterparts parts because it's just so they're just so unique. Right, and I think you know when you look at a wild counterpart from a domestic. You know, you lose a lot of not just behavior, but some of that physiology in the process of domestication. Oh, ab- yes. So definitely the, the domestic Bactrian camels. I don't even know about dromedary, but the the domestic uh, Bactrian camels can definitely not tolerate as high of salt intake as the wild counterpart. So, right. I mean, that alone. And then what else? I This is one of the tidbits that I learned today, Chris. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, if it's mm-hmm. way too dorky, you can cut it out of the podcast <laughs> because <laughs> it might do. be, it might be a little bit reaching for some of the listeners. Yeah. Uh, but I just found this was so cool. So species of the, um, camelid family or camel, camel, cam, camelids, camelidae, yeah. I think camelidae. Uh, yeah, should, camelidae. it's embarrassing that I don't know how to say that, but anyways, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh they are the only group of mammals that can produce a special, unique kind of antibodies. They're called mm. heavy chain antibodies. It's an immuno, oh, okay. and it's a special type of immunoglobin. And researchers really think that this heavy chain antibody can offer advan- several advantages in various medical and biotechnology applications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we're learning a lot. I, we're learning a lot. Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. And so I, I never, I always knew they were special. I just didn't know it was because <laughs> of their antibodies. The antibodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, just like not only the salt diets and things like that, you know, how we, we learned so much like the naked mole rats. I'm still astonished at, at them. Like just. Oh yeah. We stuff. have to do part two naked mole rat, yeah. mole, mole rat podcast. Cause we just touched on the Upon, general stuff. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could really get dorky with them. It's just crazy. So, so camels. Chris, yeah. I, I'm just gonna throw a line out there and say I think we could probably get really dorky about almost anything. Yeah, that's true. Animal that's related. True. Yeah, that's true. That's and true. you, Star Wars, me, not so much Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Popular culture, and then the science. You know, let's get to the the boring science behind it. So, camelids and their evolution, Angie. They're 
it's so cool. Again, you know, this is my dorky moments too. They're very much like horses. You know, we know more about them probably because we've we've been around them for a lot longer. They, if you had to guess where they originated, anywhere on Earth, I love playing this game with you. Where do you think camels came from? Way oh, back when. Oh, way way back when. Well, Chris, millions of years. I have a guess. Okay. I recently read an article about a camel bone being found in the Arctic. Arctic, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was in my brain. I was like Arctic or Antarctic. I was oh, Arctic's yeah, okay. the one on yeah. Arctic's yeah. the one on top. <laughs> yes, yes. It feels like the Antarctic here, but yes. Man, Antarctic I'm gonna have to put I'm gonna have to put a picture of my diploma up on, on our webpage. People are not gonna believe it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Just for for, for listeners, uh, I I always uh, because of the time change between between Chris and I, I'm always doing this podcast like late at night <laughs> after yeah, <I> know. <laughs> after a, a full day of uh, dealing with the kiddos. Yeah, yeah my brain's work. pretty fried. Yeah, no, so so, yes, yeah. Arctic on top. Yes, I read that article about this really cool uh, yeah. uh, paleo or archaeologist that was like yeah. they took him a long long time to figure out what it was, and they're like, holy cow, it's. Or holy camel. It's a camel. Oh, yeah. There you go. It's a camel. Yeah. So in the Arctic, but what continent? Ooh. Okay. Um, let me let me find that, that memory chip. <laughs> okay. uh, let me see. North wait, America. Wait, wait. Yes. Yes. Yay! Yes. Clap, see, clap, clap, I do clap, have clap, a memory clap, clap. and a brain. Yes. <laughs> yes. North America. So with horses, camels evolved in North America. And you were talking about that. And that's what I talked about earlier is in Canada, they have found evidence of these ancient anim- camels about three and a half million years ago. And so wow. they believe that they evolved in these really cold environments. And that is what led to these camels being able to survive, not only in as they crossed the land bridge into Asia, so the Gobi Desert, but then later on, the dromedaries evolved from the, the Bactrians. Right, right. And then right. they went well, off to the deserts of the Middle East and then North Africa. Well, that's what was so interesting. The article and bizarre for the archaeologists and researchers at mm-hmm. hand was everybody thinks of a camel, they think of a desert, right? right. That, that's just yeah. the association we, we have, we've grown up with. And then for mm-hmm. me, working at the zoo and learning obviously a lot more about Bactrian camels and being like, oh, hey, no, no, their, their thick winter coats come because the desert gets Free, crazy freezing, freezing yeah. uh, at yeah. night and then of course over the winter and so yeah so for me it wasn't such a far leap but i can imagine for yeah. most people that didn't know about the bactrian or the wild bactrian camels right. and their native home range that were they you know they were just shocked they're like oh we thought these feet were made for walking on sand when in in fact yeah. the feet were probably made it's- for walking on snow yeah and you know what it reminded me of if and it's an episode we we kind of forgot we did is the reindeer Right, you know, they have that right. crazy squishy, splayed mm-hmm. feet, splayed yeah, feet and pads and yeah. wide and flat, yeah, disperse their big yeah. bodies. Yeah, that's a great episode too, folks. If you haven't listened to that one, because uh, Angie really goes off on on the antlers, it's really cool. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. I was I wa- know. Uh, like I was watching Planet Earth two again, and they were showing the caribou and the babies, I love antlers. and I was like. Yeah, the moms with antlers. I know, yeah. and I, I love them so much. Before there was like fancy cameras, or I, at least before I had one, yeah. I did a, a a photo document of the right. antlers growing each week because I just mm-hmm. loved it. And then I made a post, yeah, and then I made a poster, and I could use it on tours for our guests. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. It's cool though. It's you really know, cool. you're a dork when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, but again, their changes in their skull and teeth and their limbs as those, they were four-toed and then they became the even-toed. So those other two toes migrated up the leg and we still see those remnants of that process in their legs. So, mm-hmm. and, and just to support your story about how the fact that dromedaries most likely developed from mm-hmm. Bactrians or a lineage of, mm-hmm. uh, more recent researchers have shown that in the embryonic stage, the dromedary, the one hump camels, actually have a small second hump that doesn't develop. Oh, oh, cool. I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, awesome. All right, Ange, I found the largest camel ever. This is my, oh, uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Each week, I got to look. I know. So this, this one is called the Syrian camel, so it looks more like a dromedary. Okay. But it died out about 100,000 years ago. It was huge, as big as an African elephant. 10 what? feet at the shoulder. Yeah. Their humps because I their shoulders even, I can't even picture that. Yeah, it's I have a little graphic. I'll I'll post it. 
of yeah. showing the the this Syrian camel taller than an African elephant. Their hump uh, could reach almost 13 feet because they're the single hump, right? So it goes sure. past the shoulders. Weighed almost two tons. And wow. again, in Western Asia, you know, the Middle East area. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I'd want to <laughs> ride or mess with that one. Uh-uh. <laughs> camel, can you imagine trying to get up on that thing? Oh man, yeah, big, big, big. So. As far as with humans, and I know I've been leading up to this, the domestication process. So it's about four to six thousand years. I think it, it depends on where you f- you find your resource. Right. And I, you know, and I, my horse book. I'll I'll make more announcements later in the year. It's got a, a release date in October because I did a lot Yay, of this for horses. This is an official book author. I know. I know. I know. I'm excited. You know, That's um, pretty cool. I mean. Yeah. That would be on my bucket list, but I don't think I'll ever achieve that one. <laughs> so you can, kudos you can. to you. It only took, only took me a couple of years, but I got it Man, done. Man, maybe when the kids are in college or something, but yeah. yikes, I don't know. But but yeah, no, it, no, you're I'm definitely have to yeah. tell more, tell us more about that soon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we will. But the you know, I did a lot of digging. You know, a, a lot of looking up articles, research, you know, a lot of you know science behind this on domestication, and there's still a big argument on when horses were first domesticated, you know, still in Eurasia, the, you know, the, the Kazakhstan area or the Ukraine areas where they think they were domesticated. Same thing with camels. You know, there's still a big debate on when and where, but most likely the Bactrians were first. And, you know, in, in the China, Mongolia region, their, their historical range was much bigger. Oh, so, it was much. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. they're in these tiny, which we'll talk a little bit more on conservation. Yeah. But yeah, they're not tiny, but they're definitely in like, there's like two to little four pockets, popu- yeah. pockets of populations yeah. that are very, you know, isolated. So, right. yeah, their historic range was from the Great Bend and the Yellow River uh, across the deserts of southern Mongolia and end in northwestern China and uh, Kazakh- Kazakhstan. Ka- Kazakhstan. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and they could, you know, and it just, so when they were domesticated, they just had such an impact, you know, transport, they can carry up, I've read up to 600 pounds on the back, which is crazy. Wow, wow. Yeah, they can carry quite a bit. Now, the process of domestication, I I believe in a previous pod we've talked about this, just, you know, at first the process is you select the animals that have less human avoidance behaviors, and these are the ones that you start working with, handling and you can take wild animals and quote unquote tame them to an extent, make them handleable, you know, but they're not they're still considered wild. After many generations of this and selective breeding, then you start evolving the domestic stock, which is, you know, and again, the the best example we have is the red foxes. You know, they the studies out of Russia where it took ten generations to get a domestic fox that their physiology changed, they got curled tails, their coat colors changed, and they were domesticated. So it takes about, you know, 10 generations is the best evidence we have of how long it takes. Well, would of, that be in you know, just a, a carnivore type species or is it just 10, 10 generations in general for any species? I, because that's the one study we have or the one project, you know, and, and they've, and they followed this up. This has been going on for like 60 oh, yeah, years. Sure, they, sure. they, yeah, it's not just a one study thing that they've been using these foxes to look at it. So that's the best evidence we have. So taking a Przewalski horse and trying to domesticate it, again, you're talking hundreds of years right. to do this. It just doesn't happen in one generation. I think they use the foxes or some of these smaller species because you know, their generation intervals are so, so short. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's where we have a wild population, which I think we've covered pretty well versus the domestic right. with uh, the Bactrians. So just a couple of factoids, you know, on the on the the camelids or Bactrians, they can live up to fifty years, which is pretty pretty good for an ungulate. And with the domestic camel, it's actually shorter. Their average life expectancy is thirty, mm-hmm. um, and they've only been shown to live up to about thirty five years. Okay, okay, yeah, which is you know similar for horses and donkeys and mm-hmm. other domestic uh, stock like that. Now, a group. Do you know what a group of camels is called? Oh, um... there you go. Stump the chump. <laughs> I know. I actually read this today and I, my brain is just not yeah. working. Um, it's think of the desert, a bunch of camels and they call association? it a. No. Oh. <laughs> What's a, yeah. A group of camels in the desert with a bunch of guys on the back or women and families. And they call oh, it a, um, a caravan. Cara- 
Yes! Yay! Yes! Ding, 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 ding. You're, yeah, you're, caravan. I know. You're a very good um, clue giver. Like, we should, <laughs> okay. that one, is it like, is it like the triangle or the $100,000 pyramid or something? Pyramid? Yeah, yeah. That's, I would that's want really you as a partner old. on that. <laughs> yeah, that's really you would old, not want, <laughs> You would not, oh my gosh, I'm showing my age, aren't I? You <laughs> yeah. would not want me as a partner. Well, not, you know what? Now I think there's a new game. What's that one where Ellen puts it on her forehead? Ellen DeGeneres? There's like, oh a, yeah, it's the, uh, oh, I forgot. It's the, st- oh yeah, it's the app that you put yeah. it to your forehead. So now we're still showing our age because we don't really know what the app's called as well. But there's, there's, <laughs> that anyways and charades like you'd probably yeah. you're you're you're, yeah. you're pretty good I, i'm i'm yeah i just can't draw. never pick me never pick yeah, me i can't draw <laughs> so males are called bulls females are called cows that's boring can run up to 40 miles an hour sure yeah kilometers. but the, the, the cruising yeah. pace is about 20 to 25 right. but that's more right. the, 40 is like max yeah and they kind of trot right like the opposite limbs they pace Right, they pace so the mm-hmm. the two limbs on each side move at the yes. same. Yes, yes. Oh, crazy. The, okay. The left forearm goes with the left hind yeah. leg, and the right foreleg goes with the right foreleg. Yeah, yeah. So this, the legs on the same side move in parallel. I think I said that other. right. <laughs> but yeah, you, you get so what too. I'm saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they can actually gallop too, right? Or sure. Canter, then yeah. yes. So then they're then I think it's more of a, a, a like a three beat or four beat gait, yeah. similar to a horse. Yeah. They're, they're not yeah. pacing that. That would just be silly looking all right so now let's get into some of this physiology you've been talking about the yay i know so the first thing i read was they have oval shaped red blood cells making them more efficient so their blood cells are are more efficient especially when water scarce yeah Mm -hmm. and then what i had as far as surviving these winters so their their coats actually i have it here their their outer layer can get to 15 inches 40 centimeters long. oh wow so Mm -hmm. really long and then oh have... yes, I had to I had to groom some of these camels. It's no oh, joke. Like, yeah, no you way. could make a a whole pillow outfit bedspread thing Stinky out of it. Like a, camel. A, a well, that's hair. good because the camel hair. I was going to bring that up. The undercoat is what you get with camel wool. So sure. that not this that's outer nice dreadlock looking hair. It's the undercoat. Oh, I love Miss the Dreads. I know, yeah. mm-hmm. but the camel wool is that undercoat, which is. You know, it, it makes really warm clothes. It's supposed to be really comfortable. So a couple other cool. things I, I read. They have these long eyelashes that help protect their eyes. They have the third oh. eyelid. Yeah. Oh, third eyelid? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's also should be documented that or known that, especially for us ladies out there, when a, when a camel bats their eye at you, it's and they look so beautiful yeah. with their eyelashes. Not only do they have long eyelashes, but they have a double row of eyelashes. Oh, okay, I didn't know that one. Oh, yeah. yeah, and when they so it's so when they close their eyes, it it keeps all the sand out. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, exactly. It makes sense, right? I mean, and then mm-hmm. in that spirit, the they conceal their their nostrils to help keep the sand out. Yeah, too. they have mm-hmm, they have that long flat nose, and one yeah, they can just close them, and then no sand in. I think it's just really important. I know we've already noted it, but I mean, these wild bacterian camels are so hardy they are desert mm-hmm. specialists few animals can survive the drastic temperature changes or 50 mile an hour winds and snow from siberia in the winter time to the heat in the summertime and one of the things that they have is they, they actually have minimal sweat glands for the hot mm. weather mm-hmm. um instead what they can do is they have the ability to tolerate an inter- internal temperature increase so mm. of, oh, wow, six okay. de- of six degrees celsius before Holy smokes. perspiring and that prevents less water loss. So, I mean, what would happen if your if your temperature went up 6 degrees Celsius like we're you'd be in nearing death. Yeah, we're yeah. nearing death. Yeah, yeah for yeah. us. Yeah. So, that's that's just when these guys start sweating. And that's <laughs> 6 know? degrees Fahrenheit, 6 degrees Celsius. I think we're dead. I think we're okay, dead. Okay, probably, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're right. I was, I was, you yeah. know what? I read that and I was actually in Fahrenheit. Yes, my brain was not yeah. in Celsius. So, yes, we're dead. We are at the morgue. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. these guys, these guys are just like, oh, hey, toss me a sweat towel, please. Yeah, yeah. So, that's pretty amazing. And then yeah, yeah. Um, their ears, of course, are lined with hair, too, to protect sand from going in their ears. And they, um, the other thing is they have, we haven't really talked about it yet uh, in their description, but for me, one of my favorite body parts of a camel and that's a weird thing to say, but it's totally yeah. true. Yeah. My favorite body part of the camel is their lips uh-huh. because they have a split lip. Yeah. So just like if you think of alpacas the, and the lip, they think it's to help them be able to reach some, reach their food better or sort it out. 
I don't care. I just love feeding them. I think they're amazing. They're, it's really soft. But they also have a connecting indent that runs along each nostril to the uh, cleft top lip so that any extra water or moisture that's being breathed out or, or breathed in can be trapped in the mouth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, before we get to the humps, I just, you know, that that brings up kind of their nutrition because there was an article this week talking about camels and their ability to eat cactus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was making the rounds on the news this week. And it's because they found out they have this hardened raised papillae in their mouths. Okay. So it does hurt though. They they said they could still get punctured or or wounded a little bit, but they're just tough. (laughs) So, oh yeah, but, they can. Yeah, they're yeah. T- they're t- <laughs> they're tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they can eat cactus. Yeah, and yeah. again, they're herbivores. They're opportunistic. They eat almost anything. They're ruminants like cows. So their you know bacteria helps break it down. The plant I material. Can't, in I can't. I can't. I have to stop you, Chris. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> well, talk about their rumen, right? Yes, they have this large yes, no, rumen. I yeah. know. It's so, uh, I, I have to interrupt you. But it's not a cow's rumen. Yes, it's right, A right. camel rumen, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, be- before I studied nutrition extensively in grad school, mm-hmm. at the zoo I had an interest in camel nutrition just in general because mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. early on I learned that they were a, what is known as a pseudo-ruminant. And I just love that word. I think it should be a... A yeah. band name, maybe not pseudo ruminant, maybe like <laughs> like like pseudo ruminate. Like I might think about it, but I won't. I'm faking that I'm thinking about. It. I, I th- no on stage the ruminants. I'm gonna tell you what. I was a waitress for a long. <laughs> the gassy ruminants. Yeah, no, I, I, I was a waitress for a long time, and a lot. I did a lot of customer yeah. service, so I think I pseudo ruminate all the time, where I pretend to be like thinking about something. But and like ruminating yeah, okay, that thought okay. in my mind, but really I'm I'm like not, <laughs> not thinking yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner or what. No, um, yeah. So, but anyways, yeah. So there's there's pseudo ruminants. Uh, so like ruminants, like cows, they use their foregut fermentation to break down the cellulose of cellulose of these fibrous plant species. But in contrast mm-hmm. to normal ruminants. Their four stomachs are only made up of three compartments rather than mm-hmm. a true ruminant or a cow, which is made up of four sections. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I know it's like, oh, that seems a little low, you know, you're just picking, nitpicking. nitpicking. But yeah. if you're into nutrition at all, it's not because it is different. Uh, but I actually had a little quiz for you, Chris. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. I know it's probably been a little bit since you've taught this class, but can you name me the four chambers of the cow rumen? Oh, yeah, the obamasum, the yeah, uh, abmasum, mm-hmm. the stomach of one, two, three, four. There cool, go. very good. Yeah, you're, you're like you get like a fifty percent, which is an F, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, uh, well, it's the rumen, so that's the primary site of microbial yeah. fermentation. The reticulum. Monogastrics are my uh, thing. The reticulum. The, the single stomachs. The yes. reticulum, the omasum, and it. which that re- uh, that receives the chewed cud and absorbs volatile fatty acids, mm-hmm. and the ab abomasum, which that's the true stomach, and that's mm-hmm. comparable to non-ruminants. So your favorite is the abomasum, and you did remember it. So that's basically the true stomach. Yeah, you, I remember a couple. One. Yeah. And yeah, then in yeah. camels, they have totally different names. They're called C1, C2, and C3. So. You will remember that for the rest of your life, okay. right? That's that's All super right. easy, right? Yes, that's like yes. totally easy. Yeah, C mm-hmm. one two three. But in yeah. inter- I think it's. I mean, the way that I talk to Xander is camels are definitely herbivores. Mm-hmm. They eat grasses, hays. Uh, they'll eat pellets, uh, herbivore pellet, and uh, when they're living under human care. But the wild bacterian camels, it's been documented that they might actually have a little omnivore tendencies. Okay. Because they, in desperate times, they'll eat uh, flesh of fish and bones and skins. Um, <laughs> one researcher okay. even said said shoes or other fabric, which I don't yeah. even know what that means. Besides that, they yeah. they I they do they will get into anything if you like leave it out. So you got to be kind of careful with it. Um, okay. And then, interestingly enough, the wild bacterians too are the only types of camels that will actually push and dig in the snow to look for food. Yeah. Okay. So the d- domestic counterparts won't like you, when you're talking about behavior loss from domestication. Yeah. The domesticated ones are like, oh, I know you bring that to me in a bucket. I'm not going to dig yeah. for it. Uh, yeah. But the, the wild counterparts will uh, will will dig down looking for food, which looking is an for interesting that. Cool. behavior. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some of the other, just finish up nutrition, they, you know, they can drink up to 100 liters or 30 gallons in under 15 minutes. So they rehydrate really quickly, but they can survive. I read upwards of six months without water. You yeah, know, I heard with the all, water source. Yeah, there's definitely different. Yeah, there. I mean, I heard up to seven. Some say two yeah. months. You know, so but yeah, I mean, a crazy amount of time without water for sure. We're, yeah, and that's dead. yeah, and I mean that means not absolutely no water source. It's just drinking water. So drinking, it's probably they're correct. getting it from their plants and you know their their rumen. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know, we're gonna get to humps here in a second. But stores most of the water, which which uh, you know, we do, and then they can eat snow, but not too much because it can kill them. Sure, they eat small. Yeah, they they nibble on small the snow. They eat they're dainty. Yeah. They eat small amounts because obviously that cold cold is not so good on your stomach. Right, right. Okay, so let's talk humps, Angie. I know this is one thing that you and I are kind of itching to get to. It's always know, so fun. it's so fun at yeah. the zoo, like touring kids around and being like, okay, yeah. what's in those humps? I mean. Right. So, right. what do you think most so, people answer? So they think it's full of water, right? I mean, they think that's where their water source is, but it's absolutely not. they're a desert animal. They're just gonna yeah. fill those bad boys up with water. Yeah, it's not. It is no, fat. No, it's fat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's all their fat. It gets in it's their humps. Lots. They, we always call them their lovely lady humps. Lots of fats in those humps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that, but it's a good source of energy, right? So when sure. when food sources are low and water, some water, not a lot, which we're going to talk about in a sec. Now, in the Bactrians, each hump's about eighty pounds, and then I think the dromedary is about one hundred and sixty. It's like double that, one hundred and sixty sure, pounds like, of yeah, fat. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when they start using it up, so sometimes you'll see camel humps that's that, especially with the Bactrians, will will sag or lean sure. to one side, right? Mm-hmm. And that's because they're using it up. But once they eat and refresh, then those things go right back up. Yeah, you know, pretty incredible. Normal. Right, and so the fat of the hump, I, I kind of dove into this a little bit, and Chris, we're such door. We're not always on the same same wavelength. I, I totally did too. I was <laughs> like, well, okay, I know how fats used. <laughs> as an energy source, but I need to know, right. you know, is it used as a water source? Can it be? If so, right. how much? I know. I start doing the numbers. I run the numbers, right? You know, you start looking at it. So apparently, you know, the 80 pounds of fat in each hump is 36 kilograms and there's 9.3 grams of fat releases 1.13 grams of water. Mm-hmm. So roughly, and I did some math. Or maths, as they say it in New Zealand and England and oh really? There's an S on England. Yeah, yeah, it's maths. That's That's charming. I like it. (laughs) Cheeky fellow and maths. All right. Yeah. So you let me. So so you were a cheeky fellow today and did some maths. Yes, my son, my three year old, is picking up all. He's teaching us. So and ate some some Kinder eggs. Yes. Oh, the Kinder eggs are huge here. Yeah, easy. (laughs) No problem. Kinder eggs. Yeah, every day. And uh, Fajoa, uh, I could go on and on and on. There's so many weird things here that are that's really good and amazing. That you, when you hear a three year old speak to you, that's kiwi. It is the cutest thing oh, in the world. Oh, you'll have to send so me. So going to daycare. Uh, yeah, yeah, you'll have to send me like a recording. That's super cute. Yeah, uh, the daycare. You go, t- you go see them, and uh, it's just so cute. All right, so that that equals about roughly two gallons of water in each hump, which is nothing. It's nothing. It's no. nothing. So yeah. really, it's a myth. It's kind of a myth that they get water from there. They're actually, their water, like I said earlier, is their rumen. The rumen stores about 52 gallons or 200 liters of water. Yeah, and well, of course, and I was read, uh, reading too that the fat, of course, acts as a food source. But yeah, surprisingly, the camels don't make much use of it as water. Because when fat is metabolized to release energy, the carbon and the hydrogen atoms mix with oxygen, which critical component Mm -hmm. to form co2 and water so interestingly enough the camels would have to inhale way too much oxygen to actually have this be a efficient water source yeah like an actual efficient water source uh and so instead they've of course have adapted uh tons of physiological mechanisms to save to save the water uh that they do drink um and Mm -hmm. Once you know, I think we already touched on the fact that they can eat. They can eat snow. Um, right. They their 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 stomach is actually enclosed by cha- uh, chambers filled with water. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one of the really cool things about the wild bacterians is that they can drink saline water. 
if need be. Oh, okay. And they'll basically okay. urinate concentrated salt. Uh, the, the camel's kidneys efficiently eliminate this unwanted salt, which, of course, we, we okay. can't do that. Um, and, and then yeah. they, they eliminate the salt and then return the water back to the bloodstream. Okay. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like a medical mystery. Um, yeah. And then the camel's nostrils can be closed and they can collect the water va- vapor from the air and return to their blood systems. Okay. And unlike humans, they can as- they can withstand a crazy large amount of water loss, up to 40% wow. of their body weight. Wow. Wow. So, we, yeah, we would be long dead. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you Again, said... Again, in the morgue. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you said, yeah. Yeah, if they do come... if When they do come to a water source, they can, you know, drink a lot of liters. Um, I, I read up to like 57 liters to fully restain, retain their... Uh, restore their body fluids. Right, yeah. I mean, crazy. Yeah, crazy adaptations. Now, th- the fun part, the behavior and reproduction, and I don't know, you know, what you found... You know, what's unique about their behavior, I know you could probably go on days and days and days about some of the stuff you did at the zoo. Yeah, well, I, I love them very much. And they are, like I said, they just have such personalities. Uh, the two main camels that I worked with, Indy and Mira, I love them. They're still there. They're amazing. And they had totally different personalities. Uh, Indy was kind of the big dominant female a little bit insecure, um, and Mira was just like the sweetest thing you've ever met. And I worked a lot with training Indy, and so it was really fun. Sometimes it was like who's training who, because she was pretty, yeah, she was pretty yeah. smart, but she loved, 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 loved working with me and training, like mm-hmm. use, you know, you using her brain and 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 working with me and alongside me. And then I found her sweet side, that's for sure. So. Yeah, I just, I man, I miss them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, I know. I but know. as far as uh, yes, they do do a lot of cool um, behaviors. They are very social animals, so they they mm-hmm. live in these um, groups or herds of any. Uh, for the wild Bactrian camels, they're going to be member herd members of six to twenty, and sometimes they're mm-hmm. solitary, um, but they do well in groups. Like I know our male lived with the females, and it was fine. They like they like the groups and. In the wild, there's going to be an alpha male that leads the females in their young calves. Uh, once, a, mm-hmm. once a young male reaches sexual maturity in a herd, the alpha male will chase him away, and this young male will probably join a bachelor group. Yeah, they're not territorial, so they can, they can calmly cross paths with another herd of, of camel. It's not going to you know, get, their, get their camel tails too much in a bunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but however... Um, between the dominant male and the, and then the younger males, um, there can definitely be some displays or during breeding season. We'll talk about a little bit in reproduction. Oh my gosh, there's some fun stuff with that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the male can he might urinate, defecate, uh, he'll slap his tail against. That's when you know a camel's mad at you when they start slapping their tail against their back. <laughs> so watch out. And their vocal communications, we played the clips at the beginning. Uh, so stay tuned with us to see if clip one or clip two is uh, the wild Bactrian camel or Chewbacca. Uh, but they do. They may, they may, I only played um, one type of, of moan. But, yeah, they're known to grunt, moan, squeak. Uh, and in the wild, it hasn't really been documented as much. But any, any zookeeper that's worked with them will tell you that they can be very vocal at different times. Um, however, there's no specific research to describe the frequency, which sounds like a fantastic postdoc yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one. <laughs> you could go all over the world. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I just had to find somebody to actually, yeah, fund it. But anyways, um, but no, no. With working with them, yeah, they definitely, they, you know, they, uh, they, will, they will make vocalizations. And they also do spit. Which most people know that about camels, uh, there are an alpacas, but Chris, I worked with it for them, I don't know, like five or six years, and I was knock on wood. I'm probably gonna jinx myself. The next camel, I, <laughs> the next camel I walk past is gonna like hock a loogie on me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> no, they, um, yeah, I was never spit on by a camel at all. Now I can't say that about our herd of alpaca. I was spit. <laughs> every day multiple times yeah that darn aries man he yeah. would always get me our, our alpaca so i don't know if it was just a species difference but maybe camels are slightly more selective with uh 
when they, do spit, they spit, but they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and it can go like far distances and it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's their cud. It's some of the ruminant stuff, fluid, is yeah. fluid and saliva and it. Yeah. I I love my camels, but their spit can smell uh, like death on a stick. Yeah, I, mean, it I is, bet. I bet. It is. Uh, it is pretty wretched. It is yeah, not. Yeah. Che- it is not cheeky. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> now their their generation interval. You know how hard is it for these ones that can be re- rehabilitated in the wild? Well, that's the thing, Chris. Is it's every um, probably every couple years they're going to have a calf uh, and. A, a female in her lifetime technically might have 10 to 12 calves if she's bred every year. But yeah, the gener- the turnaround isn't as quick because their gestation period is longer. It's a, Yeah, it's pretty long. And yeah, their gestation is 12 to 14 months. So, and it can result in one, sometimes two, but take, like horses, typically only one offspring. So yeah, they give they they do it about every two years. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean not not too too long, but you know it takes a while. And then the to kind of link the the male mating behavior we just talked about. It's this behavior that every year during the breeding season for a few months the males just are are crazy. You know, high levels of testosterone. Yeah, they have high levels of testosterone, and so yeah, right. But yeah, so rut, rut is the name typically referred to the mating season of mammals, which include ruminants. Um, and so deer, sheep, camel, goats, uh, bison, camels. And yeah, the males experience increased testosterone, like you said, um, exaggerated sexual dimorphisms, um, increased aggression, of course, and of course, interest in the ladies. And in some, most species, it's triggered by shorter day lengths, but it depends on the exact species. Uh, mm-hmm. And like you said, yeah, the males can mark themselves with you know mud or sometimes they um, try to make themselves more visually appealing to mm-hmm. the females. And now the camels that I worked with, the male satchel, bless his heart. Uh, mm-hmm. He, it's, it's just a really interesting thing to experience, especially as an, as a keeper, because these are your babies. You take care of them every day. Mm-hmm. You are monitoring their health, their well being, nice. their happiness, everything about them. And yeah. so what happens in camels and a lot of other animals experience mammals, that ruminants that experience rut is they'll go off food. And they yeah. use their energy reserves, reserves to sustain themselves during this period. But it doesn't really make sense. It's a counterintuitive. It's like, well, you need to breed and do your thing and be all dominant and, and be, be tough. tough and yeah. like, you need more energy yeah. for that. Yet they stop eating or they eat very little. And as a zookeeper, it just like one of the things you monitor on a daily basis is food intake. And then, of course, defecation and urination. Um, it's a big, and the weight of the animal, the body condition of the animal is a big indicative of health. Mm. And they can, and animals mm. can't tell you when something's wrong. So their weight and their appetite and things like that are, right. that's how they talk to you. And don't they, don't they like, like grind their teeth, make gurgling yeah, sounds, they're, the slapping they're tail? Just, they're yeah. a hot mess. Like, first of all, yeah. <laughs> I love, I love male camels, but I'm yeah. glad that. Human men don't act like this when they're interested in a lady. <laughs> so this is this this doesn't go in the book, right? This does not <laughs> go in the like hey The mating display of the hyena is not Yes, and the the rut <laughs> behavior of the camel guys just don't do it. It's not cute. Uh because I didn't mention <laughs> Don't spit. Yeah, it's just cause that's where just where I was going with this. So really their <laughs> their physical nature doesn't change too much, right? They maybe lose weight or whatever, they kind of act a little tougher and show off a little bit more. But one thing, they definitely increase like their saliva and they get really frothy, drippy, crazy amounts of saliva. And I guess that tells the ladies that they're hot. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if John has a cookie crumb on his, Come yeah, see. if John has a cookie crumb, cookie crumb on his lip, I'm like, oh, yuck. So a piece of salad. I can imagine yeah. if he was like foaming at the mouth and grinding his teeth Rabbit. and like flicking his tail at me and squat. They they also drop their hind legs and kind of do like a squatting display, or it's probably to ur- urinate yeah. to show them. And that's all important for pheromones. But yeah, no, don't do it, guys. Um, no thanks. Yeah, no even thanks. Satchel loved him, loved him to death, strategy, but yeah. that that uh, it was it was not it was not his uh, best best time of the year. 
Interesting smells. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just... And some of that too is maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe I'm thinking of it wrong. Maybe some of that is actually not to necessarily attract a female. Maybe it's to scare off another male. I don't know. Maybe. Could it, be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I'm tough. Something. Yeah, and nasty. And, I'm, I'm, t- I'm, it's, it's I'm tough hotness. and nasty, like and that. I'm a pseudo ruminant who's not eating right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Animal behavior is just such an amazing field. It's such an amazing field. Now, the conservation, we talked about they're critically endangered, right? Yeah, population's decreasing, um, and the wild Bactrian camels facing a population size reduction of at least 80% within the next three generations, or wow. about 50 years. Uh, and they believe there's less than 1,000 of them. Um, so, And they surviving in Mongolia, in parts, in a, parts of Mongolia, and then in China. Now, uh, that... Before we get to the Chewbacca versus the camel, you know, we always like to highlight a couple of organizations, and I know we got a, a couple special ones this week. Well, Chris, yes, I always like to find a couple organizations that are doing great things for the species that we highlight each week. However, this week, uh, interestingly enough, there really is only one conservation organization. It's called mm. the Wild Camel Protection Foundation, and they can be found at www.wildcamels.com with an S, camels.com, so not org.com, wildcamels.com. They have a presence on Facebook. If you type in wild bacterian camels, it should come right up. And and this is the only charity in the world. That's it. There's only one with a, spe- with a specific yeah. mission to save um, these remarkable camels and, and then also uh, protect the pristine deserts that they live in from environmental collapse and issues. So, yeah, they're, and so they have one sole mission, and their main mission is to protect the wild Bactrian camel because it's critically, critically endangered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they do amazing things. They educate the locals. They fund research projects um, about how to better learn about camels and how to better protect them, so learning about their behavior and how they live mm-hmm. and how they migrate or move around. Uh, they, the Wild Camel Protection Foundation also acts as an the only advisor and consultant for a very large, uh, the Lop, the Lop Nur Wild Camel National Nature Reserve in China, which is like um, close to 200,000 square kilometers. So they're like the experts helping tell people what to do with their land and the best way to do it. And then they also established a wild Bactrian breeding program in Mongolia. So they mm-hmm. have uh, um, 15 wild Bactrian camels are currently uh, living in China and Mongolia. And this is really important because with only with less than a thousand animals in both China and Mongolia, one environmental disaster, one disease, they could be yeah. wiped out. So wiped out. keeping, yeah. you know, keeping a, a population living under human care is really critical for the genetics. And then they've actually also released some. So they're, they're bred in, ca- in captivity and then, they've been released back into the reserves. With that being said, there's several zoos today that I want to give a shout out to that uh, actually give proceeds to the Wild Camel uh, Protection Foundation. So my first one is the Big D, my hometown, Detroit, Michigan. Oh, okay, Detroit. It's not my hometown, it's my home state. I'm I'm from the other side of the state, but... D Town, Detroit Zoo, yes, awesome. You go. Yeah, yeah. They they love themselves some wild Bactrian camels, and then of course some other major zoos that donate to the Wild Camel uh, Protection Foundation is the Bronx Zoo, Alaska Zoo, Cincinnati Zoo, uh, Zoological Society mm-hmm. of London, uh, American Association, uh, the American Association of Zookeepers out of Potawatomi, and then of course I have to give a big 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 shout out to anybody in the Midwest. If you are traveling through the greater Chicago area, please, please stop by both the Lincoln Park Zoo and or Brookfield Zoo. They have Bactrian right. camels on display. You can see them out in the winter months, and they are loving it because mm-hmm. they have all the hair yeah. and the fur, and, they're, and right. they're just like they could live out there every day, all day. Of course, we do bring them in at nighttime. But yeah, uh, Stop by for sure, and then if it's the summertime, they'll be sh- or in the spring. They'll be shedding their coats. They look kind of like a hot mess when they shed their their fur, but mm-hmm. it's it's once they get to that, yeah, it's normal. totally normal. Yeah. They're not unhealthy. Yeah, uh, we yeah. and usually uh, a lot of zoos will put signage up about that in case the public asks about that. And mm-hmm. so yeah, and I really think that um, at 
and you know, of course, if you're at Lincoln Park Zoo, you can stop and say hi to uh, Mira and Indy, blow them some kisses for me, and then and <laughs> don't they'll get, get spit oh, on. They would, they don't spit. <laughs> they're angels. Um, yeah, yeah, at least yeah. they weren't when I left. Yeah. They might be upset that I left, and so maybe yeah. they're not now. Uh, but yeah. then also uh, the Brookfield Zoo on their website, they do a really nice job talking about the wild camel protection foundation so i was really mm-hmm. pleased to see that with brookfield and they have a uh, one of their bactrians camel is named christina and you can actually adopt her uh through the brookfield um chicago zoological okay. society website so yeah i gotta give out and give them a shout out and I'm, I'm pretty excited too because uh our next interview i get to sit down with a very important person out of brookfield zoo and talk about some really Really powerful yes. and uh, conservation, yeah, yeah, conservation issues. Some really um, yeah. interesting and uh, um, real life conservation issues that are happening now. So, yeah, yeah gotta give. Uh, like I said, there's no competition between Lincoln Park and Brookfield. Yeah, yeah, they all love each other. <laughs> well, Alicia. I've got, yeah, I've, well, I've got Alicia. friends on both sides of the line. And in fact, and yeah, like I said, yeah, in yeah, fact, yeah. I, in fact, I sit down with one next week. So yeah, or later this week. Okay, so cool. yeah, get excited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just, you know, we were talking about what to do and, and some of the amazing stuff people are doing around the, the world. Again, one of the big things we like to highlight each week is, is conservation tips. And again, we're working towards this carbon neutral lives. Last week, we talked about turning lights off. But you can replace your halogen lights with LED lights. LED lights are the future. That's what you need to be buying. They might be a little bit more expensive, but they last longer. They can last up to 10 years. Oh, yeah, Chris. They, yeah. they last, I, I don't think, I think we did this like five or six years ago, yeah. and we have not replaced a bulb yet. Yeah, they last forever. They take less energy. And power companies, like especially during the winter, won't turn, you know, with LED lights, they don't turn on some of their more carbon producing combustion, like coal and other things to produce power, like in the winter when they need to to make up some of that, that deficit. So go around your house, see how many halogen lights you have, replace them with LED lights. And again, you're making an impact leading towards carbon neutral lives. Now, real quick, I, I love it. before we get to Chewy, I did promise a camel story. So really quickly, if you're ever in Egypt around the pyramids, which is should be on everybody's bucket list, one of the, the, the most special places on earth that I've been. And when they go and you get a camel ride at the pyramids, there's a lot of locals and they're like, come ride our camels. And, and, and you're like, Oh, how much? And they're like, no, 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 just get on the camel, get on the camel. And they like usher, <laughs> they're really pushy. <laughs> they get you on the camel and you go on this wonderful ride around the pyramids, out to the desert, all this stuff. And then when you get back, they're like, that will be 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 Egyptian dollars. And you're like, what? You said no, no money. And they're like, no, no, you pay now or they'll never put the camel down. They, they will not let the camel sit down <laughs> and let you oh, off. My. So it's called Kush. It's called yes. Kush. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is funny. Yes. So if you're, uh, yes. If you're ever in Egypt, just negotiate a price up front. But there's no such thing as a free camel ride. Okay. And oh this is the drama. That's so funny, Chris. I love that. I've never heard that story. Yeah. Wow, yeah I love yeah. it. All right. So Chewy or the camel? Okay, so clip number one was drum roll. It's, the this wild Bactrian camel. Yeah, I know that was too easy for me because I'm a, a a dork. I'm like the biggest Star Wars dork. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, it does sound so familiar, though. It, well, I mean, it, or, or similar. Actually, very similar, and it, yeah. and it's hard because they make so many sounds, and Chewbacca makes so many sounds. So yeah. of course, it does. It's not going to line up perfectly. But I, you know me, Chris. I had to keep yeah. digging. That researcher yeah. blood yeah, runs yeah. deep in my veins. So after a little digging, I found out. I don't remember. I didn't. I don't read the names or care about anything like that. But the guy, in, the guy in charge of the sound of mm-hmm. Chewbacca, spliced together sounds from a lot of different animals. So Chewie's vocalizations were actually created from a lot of different animals, uh, field recordings mm-hmm. of different sounds spliced together, including bears, lions, badgers, a walrus, and oh, wow. camels. And the camels. Yay! Yeah, okay. I he knew had it. to. I he knew had it. to. I knew, knew it. I knew it. I was, yeah, he had to. I, I hate to say that I was right, but I, I feel like I feel uh, very, very happy about that. And I can't wait to tell yeah. tell John about this. Yeah, no, it was cool. And I just, Solo just came out and I saw that uh, with Jesse and it was it was a good movie. I liked oh, it. and just for some, just for people's knowledge, 
If you do want to learn how to make your own chewy noises, there is seriously a step-by-step step instructions on how to vocalize like chewy. So you can okay, find that we'll put on, that on YouTube. The, we'll, put that the sh- we'll put it on the show notes. <laughs> I, I'm not going that far. I'll, I'll just keep listening to camels. I think they're yeah, – I, yeah, I yeah. think they – I like their sounds better than chewy, but that's just me. All right. And then just for us, uh, please don't forget to subscribe or uh, you know rate and review us. Uh, again, if we get 10 Patreon subscribers this week, Angie will shave her legs. And <laughs> – <laughs> And one thing, I, I, in all seriousness, if you can give us some feedback on the weekly news segment, I know we've only done it like three times, but do you like it? Is there value in it? You know, what should we focus on? If you can just post that on Facebook, you know, we'll, I'll try to remember to post that when, uh, the day that we post this episode. So Angie and I are, you know, it takes a lot of work to do all this. And so we're like, is it worth the effort? And if you're getting value on it, we're going to keep doing it. So that's, absolutely, that's the bottom line. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and we have some we have yeah. some fun too. Uh. Yeah, we have fun and we love our listeners. So thank you and be stay tuned for not only Thursday's interview with uh, Brookfield, but also Friday's new segment. And we'll be back next week with a new species. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.